Uh, my name is Janine Koch and I'm a PhD student here at Alto and my, in my work I'm looking for collaborative AI possibilities to support design practice and especially inspiration. Um, starting with this image, you probably have seen a lot of this kind of stock photo images uh, in the context of newspapers about AI interaction and whatever. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that my product and the most work is actually not that fancy. Um, but it's actually still quite interesting, so that's why I'm here and that's why I want to talk about. Um, in this talk, I will take you first through current understanding of what is actually creativity, what are we talking about, and what is actually collaboration, because that's very necessary to understand how to actually design collaborative AI systems. And in the end, I will uh, show you a vision of how an AI actually can work together with designers to collect inspirational material based on a project I recently finished. So, let's start, let's start with creativity. So, what is actually creativity? Like, in easy words to say, it's like it's the use of imagination and original ideas to create something. Um, and it's basically the source of innovation, and it usually because it actually uh, because it is very early stages, it has a high impact on the quality of the ideas, products, and artifacts that you actually develop. So research has looked at that in different angles. You usually distinguish um, four different instances that can have creativity. You can look at the, a person, the characteristics, the um, uh, intellectual characteristics of a person and how this impacts the create, creative process. You can look at the press as it's called here, which is the environmental um, and external impact on creativity, it might be physical or social. You can look at the creativity of a product, of an outcome, how novel is it, how innovative is it, and um, how can we uh, measure and understand that. And you can actually look at the process, which is basically the um, chain of action and events that uh, is, are involved in doing creative work. So the first three parts are very interesting, but in the context of applying AI technology in these, pro uh, in these processes, um, we can uh, we can focus on the aspect of process and how we uh, support and enable a better creative process. So what is a creative process? A creative process basically has four main parts. It always has a part of collecting information, collecting inspiration, um, and inspirational material. Then we have the create part where you actually co explore, compose, evaluate over and over again. Is that actually feasible? What do I actually want to do? What are my goals, my intentions? This is often put into relation to other ideas from your own experience or from other participants in the creative process. And this all together is then in the end often donated, as it's called here, to, to further steps in the process. So if you develop an idea, you, you forward that to other people or to other parts of the process. Then later on does, for example, prototypes or other kind of uh, things building on it. So where do we find creative processes? We find creative processes basically uh, in most of uh, explorative um, understanding and explore, uh, explorative processes like in drawing, in coming up with new dance choreographies, like how if I want to express something, I try to explore it with my body, or for example, in creating new music pieces. It's kind of, this is not a linear thing, this is something we see and we grab from wherever we can uh, inspirational material. But probably what you are mostly familiar with, because I assume many of you have a design background, is design ideation. It's the early part of the design process where you do brainstorming, for example, with your uh, uh, co-workers. You probably have worked a lot with post-it notes in your life. Or you actually do visual, uh, inspira collecting visual inspirational material to basically create a common understanding uh, among the colleagues where the, uh, where the product or the project or the service you want to design actually should go to. What do they all have? Sorry. What do they all have in common? 
If you look at the structure of these creative processes, we can see that they have a certain aspects that they all have in common. They're usually open-ended tasks, so it's really, really hard to define when this process is actually over. It's like when we have to gather five ideas, when we have gathered ten ideas, um, or uh, enough uh, material to basically move forward. They're usually highly iterative, and the ideas and the goals are actually changing over the process. So you can't, you can't say in the beginning what is actually the approach or the idea you will fulfill in the end. And by doing that, you actually search and construct new ideas and concepts while you're going through it, and you also basically reject some ideas you have. Um, these processes in general are highly subjective because they're coming from your own experience. They're coming from the discussion you have with your colleagues. And they're enhanced through your own and external stimuli enhanced to that. So, what is AI for creativity or better, like, why is there so little work in AI for creativity yet? Well, um, see... So if you look at the way AI technology is designed nowadays, there's a lot of traditional machine learning algorithms that actually have, like hard pro uh, ha have a hard time to actually handle these kind of aspects. So, for example, if you look at deep learning, deep learning doesn't work in this context or hasn't worked yet because it's a predictive algorithm. Uh, but what we are talking about here is that we have evolving objectives. So what is actually the thing we want to predict here? So a traditional machine learning algorithms like that don't work when we don't have predefined goals as we have in creative processes. They also usually are relying on very objective understanding on an outcome in order to optimize for it, in order to go for it, which we don't have in these uh, processes then creativity in general is enhanced not only by the discussion but also by what, what many people would call serendipitous encounters, which means like material that you haven't thought of, that you didn't want to go for. Um, but in this context, um, machine learning algorithms have problems with these unexpected events necessarily. And of course, in the end, what does an idea in the end of an uh, ideation phase actually means. It's an abstract concept, which is very hard to describe sometimes in words or in, in variables. And hence, traditional machine learning pro uh, uh, approaches that usually assume predefined objectives have a really hard time working in this context. So there are act there's actually work that try to overcome that in a very interesting interactive manner. I just brought you a few. Um, there's, a, there's a project called Viewpoint AI where they actually built a rule-based system. So people were sitting there and actually building rules what the machine should do in certain cases. But what it is, is actually um, it is an AI agent that's projected on a surface and that basically observes what the human is dancing and based on that makes a decision what should, how should the AI now move. And due to this interaction, even though it's predefined rules, it actually feels like the, the other person is dancing with you. Another um, project I brought you today is called Bob. Uh, it's a system that observes how a musician basically plays music pieces and then, um, and then tries to uh, support jazz improvisation by observing jazz players basically playing their piece and then adapting the own knowledge they have from the musician they were trained on to the current work the other musicians in the jazz ensemble are playing for. So while these, uh, these systems are already quite interesting in this context, they're not really collaborative. So they don't really adapt or take into account what the other person is necessarily doing um, and make own decisions based on that. So what does it actually mean to have a collaborative AI? Well, to come to that, we have to talk about what collaboration by itself actually means. So collaboration is a, uh, is a process through which parties who see different aspects of a problem can constructively explore their differences and search for solutions that go beyond their own limited vision of what is possible. If we take this definition into the context of creativity, 
it's usually known as collaborative creativity. When more than one person works together on a creative problem, they usually the, the interception between uh, these two people usually is on a creative scale higher than what each individual would have come up with. Hence, collaborative creativity is a very important aspect, especially in when we're looking for ideas and when we're looking for inspiration. In order to actually create collaborative creativity, there is, from a cognitive science perspective, three aspects we have to look at. The first one is so-called theory of mind. Basically, it's the ability of humans to um, identify that I have my intentions and I have my goals with everything I do. For example, if we uh, work in a brainstorming session, I say something, I have an idea, but it has a certain intention in me. And I understand that everyone, uh, everything another person says, this person also has an intention, a goal. And when you add an idea to a brainstorming process, I try to interpret what your intention is, on what your goal is, and this allows me to actually work together with you. The second point is grounding. Well, your idea and your intention might be very different from mine. So in order to come out to a common ground among a group of people, we do grounding. Grounding means that we try to figure out if we're currently on the same path. Humans do that, for example, if I have an idea and you add another idea, I see in the idea you present me if we actually have a current understanding of what we're doing. Or if you ask me questions regarding the process we are currently looking for, um, then I understand if you actually um, and have the same idea in your head about what we are currently doing um, than, um, yeah, than me. And the last one is learning. Basically the idea of if I, if I am able to interpret what your idea is, idea is what your intention is, I can I can take that into my uh, understanding of a current problem and I basically can combine that and learn based on that and come up with new ideas. These all three things are necessary to actually create a successful um, collaborative uh, creativity process. There's very little work on that, but there is. There's, um, this project called Drawing Apprentice, which basically is a system or an AI that tries to draw together with an artist and tries to signal the, the artist why it currently draws certain aspects in this project. Um, so <laughs> um, it tries to draw together with the designer and the designer can also specify how much it actually wants to go in like more abstract drawing or like detailed drawing currently. So, coming all this background right now, let, I would like to present you my work that is basically based on these three ideas of like, what is creativity, what does it mean to have uh, AI in creative processes, and what is actually collaboration. So in order to do that, I looked at uh, one method within the uh, inspirational process, which is called mood board design. Uh, for people that are not familiar with it, um, the, the mood board process, uh, the idea of the mood board process is to generate and create original and useful inspirational ideas to define and explore what is actually desirable in a project. Usually these are um, visual collages that have the intention to convey a certain mood, hence the name mood board. Um, and visual materials actually considered the most suitable in supporting the construction of new ideas because it goes away from our understanding of words and our limitation of understanding. So these processes are actually most beneficial to hard to in hard to describe processes or like open innovations where you actually can't find the words initially. Um, so hence you usually start out with a lot of uh, visual material like magazines, you cut them out, you glue them together and so on in a traditional way and afterwards in the composition you define what it actually means for you. So, why do we actually need AI for that? Well, as I just said, usually you go out and you uh, collect visual material and you interpret it later. The problem is if, if you want to do digital mood boards, the way for example search engine works is the other way around. 
the search engine says like, hey, I can give you every image you want. Just tell me what the name is or what it should be about. So it basically turns around the process and says like, instead of you collecting material, I ask you first how you phrase it and then I can show you everything. As well as the second point, an able serendipitous encounter. If I go for a magazine, I don't know. There's always material I have never expected to see. But I can use it as a trigger, as a stimuli and work with it. Um, the same in search engine and digital uh, ways, it's often related to what are you searching for. So the likelihood that you actually come across material that you didn't expect is very low because you actually search for it. Um, so in this case, in these two cases, we can use, for example, AI technology to overcome that, to present visual material that you actually don't have to look for, that actually can be, for example, external to uh, what you're currently doing to enable serendipitous encounters. And the last one is to facilitate collaborative creativity. So as I said before, collaborative creativity enables you to actually extend your own vision and your own idea beyond what you actually thought it could be by having another agent or another collaborator in the process um, to trigger new ideas and to discuss new ideas. In this work we especially focus on the collection of material, however it could be also extended to the other stage, stages of creating mood boards. So this is roughly how the interface looks like and I actually brought you a short video of one designer working with it on the topic of banking. Um, what you can see in the upper left corner are like normal design tools like put it to the top, put it to the bottom, uh, change colors of backgrounds, change colors of uh, elements and so on. On the left side you have a normal image search which basically is um, uh, images as you use in your browser. It's live so I don't really control what this is about. And on the right side you have the AI suggestions that are actually presenting an image together with like steering um, widgets and uh, it tries to also explain in, uh, to some extent uh, why it for example currently suggests this image to give the uh, designer an understanding why um, this should be feasible. So. I think the interesting why everyone came here today is like how does the right side work? I mean like the rest we basically know how it works. It's like it's a canvas where we put images on. Um, so how do we actually come to this image? Well, we have seen the designer working with search and on a canvas. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part comes now how does this AI actually works and where does it get the images from and how? I'm not getting into too much detail today about the algorithm. But the algorithm that stands behind there is a corroborative contextual bandit. It's a family of uh, systems that are usually used for recommendation engines like Netflix is using it, Yahoo used to use contextual bandits and so on. And this is an extension of these contextual bandits uh, used for recommendation engines. So uh, in order to design such an uh, algorithm, we first have to understand what is actually the creative space an AI actually should work in in order to make useful and suitable suggestions. So um, researchers and I looked at different mood boards and different uh, elements that are used in mood boards and basically see there are basically two distinguishing factors which are either visual characteristics or the content presented on the image. What this system is about and what it allows actually to work in this context is that given uh, visual features like for example color contrast, color and brightness and other things, it is able to say that uh, given the current mood board I see right now, I, I, I detect that it's actually for example in the space at a certain point. Now the algorithm, the way it's built is that it has a probabilistic model behind to say is it currently good to go for something similar that I currently see on the mood board visually or is it maybe good to move in the space into another aspect to, to present another aspect, another visual feature that actually goes away from what I'm currently seeing. These things um, are, so this is a green image that's like an abstraction, can either go for own other green images or it can go for um, 
for other aspects, as other visual aspects of images. These are probabilistic uh, uh, functions, which are because it's an online learning system updated with every interaction designer does with the system, which means it actually learns over time when it is at which point it is a good idea to move on to another um, to a, another uh, part of the creative space. And when is it good to actually follow a certain idea we're currently developing? Well, this is only visual. Visual says as a lot, but not too much. In order to actually make it meaningful, we also need content. So, um, and creating a content space, we actually use the approach of observing the designer that, um, that actually is searching in a normal search engine for words and basically use the search words that were successful um, in, for an uh, association engine that basically gives us human associations, like in this case banking, for accounting and bookkeeping and budget and similar things. Um, and this together with the, visuals, uh, with the visual decision is actually live queried in the background to find an image online that actually, uh, um, that actually is successfully mapped to uh, one of the content spaces and the visual space. So it, it queries in the background the images in the combination, and only if it's successful, it will suggest something to the designer. We showed this tool to uh, 16 designers and um, asked them afterwards how they liked it or what they thought about it, and uh, I quickly go through that now. In terms of inspiration, uh, many people actually uh, reported that they found quite some material that was suggested by the uh, AI agent that was either very different or actually to the extent so radic uh, radical different that some even thought of basically replacing the whole mood that they were currently working on and basically using it as a new starting point. Um, agency. Um, talking about collaborative creativity, we need agency in the system. The system was designed in a way that actually one designer works with one agent, so one agent presents one image with one description because it's a participant in this process. Uh, most people actually felt that they don't work alone, that they feel like they're brainstorming with like two people or um, creating it with more than one person. Um, however, because the system actually can also align with the designer, which is something I can't control, which is like based on the learned behavior of the system, uh, some people actually notice that it starts aligning over time uh, with their understanding and with their pics of images in a visual and contextual space. And the last thing um, I brought you to they so far like of the study was uh, explainability. We had um, explainable um, suggestions. So why why does the AI currently pick the image it suggests? But also if the designer adds something to the screen, which is very different from what the AI actually expects, it starts asking why did you actually select this image that is so different what I don't expect. Talking about grounding, asking, re requesting uh, ideas. Um, so people actually uh, uh, consider that as useful, especially the questioning aspect. The description aspect, not so much because it's a highly visual process. So people actually look more on the image than actually on the explanation of the AI. However, the requesting, why did you actually choose that, was considered quite, quite interesting by some people. In a good way, because people mentioned like maybe next the next time they actually look for images, they thought about maybe I should consider different aspects of the image, but also critical because some people actually felt criticized by the AI. It was like, was it the right thing I was doing? Am I going somewhere in the wrong direction here? Which was not our idea. So before I leave you, um, some food for thought um, comments we got from designers. The first one was about the opportunity of creative AI in this context. People, are, so, um, some of the um, people were mentioning that um, because it's so hard to actually retrieve inspirational material online, people tend to actually always go to the same website, calling it Behance, calling it Pinterest, calling it Dribble, calling it you know all these pages, um, which often leads to the. Uh, um, 
tension between I create my own creative property or I actually look what other people have done. Systems like that because they actually overcome it to give you the material again without actually you searching for allows you to create maybe more authentic stuff, maybe not, but in this case it was actually considered as something positive. However, some people also mentioned that well, you know, it's a practice, it's a, it's a thought-provoking um, and interpretive practice. What actually happens if all the inspirational material comes from an AI? Do I actually become lazier? What is actually my role in there? Is it actually me that creates that? Or what is my creative aspect in the context of finding these inspirational materials, composing them and interpreting them for future designs? Thank you so much and yeah, if you're interested in participating in studies um, or want to learn more about that, um, just write me an email or go on my website and yeah, thank you, open for questions.